for today to tell you all about our recent work in ENCODE phase three. And the title of my talk is um, Building an ENCODE Registry of Candidate Cis Regulatory Elements for Human and the Mouse. So um, if you look at the human genome, you probably are well aware uh, well aware of the fact that only 2% of the human genome has um, coding exons, which code for proteins, while the remaining 98% of the genome contains a large number of different kinds of things. First of all, our genes are very large, so we have, we have very long introns. Um, besides introns, we also have non-coding RNA genes. We have a ton of pseudogenes. Half of our genome is um, repeats, different kinds of repeats um, with uh, sign and line, different transposons. And just among those um, repeats, I'm wondering if I, I can use, um, ah, works. So um, just among all these elements, um, there are some of them that regulate the transcription of genes. These are the ones I call the regulatory elements. So the estimate of what percent of our genome is dedicated to regulatory elements varies from paper to paper, but I think um, you can be um, pretty assured that roughly around 20% for sure um, would have one kind or another regulatory function. So um, here um, I illustrate several kinds of regulatory elements. For example, promoters, is the region that's right next to the five prime end of the gene, which is indicated with an arrow here. And very often I will call this, this start of a gene transcription start site, STSS, in future slides. And here you probably see my colors here and uh, my slides have been color coded for ease of understanding. So promoters are in red. So this is the regions where really the um, Pol2, RNA, uh, RNA polymerase 2, 3, and so on, polymerases bind and then start the transcription of a gene. We also have enhancers, which is color coded as in yellow, and they are far away from the TSS of a gene, transcription starts of the gene, and uh, they um, help promoters to activate the gene transcription. Um, we also have silencers sometimes called repressors, they repress the activity of transcription. And also, um, there are insulator regions. Um, our genome is a linear, linear dimensional um, string of uh, DNA, um, and it doesn't really have boundaries, um, no road signs, and the insulators are the elements that kind of serve as the boundaries between um, different kinds of elements, um, specifically for one example, it can block the interaction between the enhancers and the nearby promoters or transcription star sites. So um, regulatory elements are a, a very um, uh, heated research area for quite a while now. Um, one of the motivations for studying regulatory elements is that um, there are um, a lot of mutations that have been discovered in diseases, both in Mendelian diseases, also as um, in um, whole genome um, um, GWAS studies, um, uh, association studies, whole genome association studies. Um, so these diseases, um, such as uh, polydactyly, a cleft palate and congenital heart defects, examples I show here, and uh, the mutations that are discovered for the individuals that are inflicted by these diseases. And very often these mutations are not in the coding regions of the genes. Presumably, if you have a coding region mutation, it would lead to very severe um, detrimental effects um, so that uh, an individual may not um, be observed frequently in the population. However, um, they don't just occur randomly in the genome. They don't occur in the 90% of the genome that's non-coding. Um, they are actually highly focused in regulatory elements. Presumably, um, these would um, break down the regulatory elements and lead to the phenotypes as in these diseases. 
So here is a number 80% of the non-coding genetic variants associated with human diseases lying in non-coding regions of the genome. And uh, um, a good portion of these are in regulatory elements. So ENCODE is a large international consortium that was established in 2003, <laughs> a while back. Um, so um, the goal of the consortium is to uh, catalog all functional elements in the genome, both coding and non-coding. And there is a huge component, uh, community component, to develop freely available resources for the research community. And 90% uh, um, uh, of the effort of ENCODE is on human, um, roughly 10% on other species, um, with mouse being the primary other species that we work on. The consortium has um, a few hundred um, members, and uh, um, the consortium paper um, had uh, 500 authors that just came out um, in the past summer. Um, the project has different components, um, some um, data generation, data analysis, and data repository. And uh, um, as you just heard that, um, I have been leading the data analysis center of ENCODE since 2012. And uh, um, the goal of that is to perform integrative data analysis um, that will serve the goals of this project um, well. So you can see um, here um, is, um, is, a, is a picture of uh, one of the consortium meeting um, near, near the Salk Institute. And uh, these are people who, who um, were main players in uh, phase three of the ENCODE consortium. Right now we're in phase four. So um, as I just briefly alluded to, um, ENCODE three publications appeared on uh, July 29th of this year. And uh, um, um, we, uh, we were fortunate enough, um, the Data Analysis Center were fortunate enough to um, lead um, and coordinate the effort of this uh, particular paper. It's a huge package, as you can see. It's, um, it's on the, occupied the uh, cover of the Nature Journal, and they make this DNA strand with a three in it to indicate it's phase three of the ENCODE project. Um, phase three here. And uh, um, we, we co-led um, with a bunch of other um, data production um, investigators and also um, data coordination um, leaders to put together this uh, manuscript. Um, and today I'm going to talk to you about the, some of the main, main uh, results from this manuscript. So um, just a little bit of uh, background biology about uh, enhancers. Um, so if we zoom in to um, enhancer, uh, enhancer region, these are the regions that enhance the transcription of a gene. And um, eukaryotic genome um, is uh, very tightly packaged into a unit called the nucleosome. Um, here is a DNA wrapped around um, an octamer of histone proteins. So that's the basic unit of eukaryotic eukaryotic um, uh, chromosome. So um, enhancer usually are the regions that um, um, that's, uh, one nucleosome is unwound so that other regulatory proteins, specifically transcription factors, abbreviated as TFs here, and there are three colors here indicating three different types of TFs. And if you look at the human genome, there are roughly 1800 TF genes encoded in our genome. So we really need a lot of switches to regulate the gene expression. So an enhancer, um, if you want to identify enhancers, you can use a technique that uses an antibody that recognizes each TF and uh, pull it down, pull the chromatin down and uh, chop up the neighboring regions and then um, sequence the bound DNA. And then you, when you map the sequencing reads to the reference genome, you see a peak, and we call it ChIP-seq peak. So this technique is a ChIP-seq, chromatin immunoprecipitation, followed by deep sequencing. ENCODE has performed um, ChIP-seq experiments on um, many um, transcription factors. Um, uh, some of these are, are redundant, uh, the same 
not redundant, but the same transcription factor, but in multiple different kinds of biosamples. And that's why this number is larger than the number I told you, 1800 different TFs encoded in our genome. Also, um, uh, the nucleosomes, um, the histone proteins in the nucleosome are not just there to, to be like packaging. They um, also have regulatory functions. Specifically, the tails of these histone proteins uh, can be um, modified post-transcriptionally. And uh, there are hundreds of different kinds of histone modifications on uh, different residues of the histone tails. And uh, um, you can perform the same kind of technique chip seek using modified histone tails against modified histone tails and then um, sequence the bound DNA. And ENCODE has already uh, also produced the chip seek, um, chip seek data for many um, thousands of um, experiments targeting different kinds of histone modifications in um, multiple biosamples. And also, um, I said briefly, um, so this region, the enhanced region, um, very often um, it's lacking a nucleosome because if it's packaged, then transcription factors won't be able to bind. Instead, um, instead of a nucleosome here, um, you have transcription factors bind so that um, it's called um, uh, nucleosome free, um, the region is nucleosome free. So DNA is an endonuclease that can um, cleave open chromatin regions. So if you make a cut, as these two pairs of scissors indicate, um, at this region and then liberate the DNA that's unbound to nucleosomes and then map the reads onto the genome, um, you have the results of uh, DNA-seq experiments. So ENCODE also has performed quite a number of DNA-seq experiments. So, um, the, our project um, was um, to integrate all these um, genome-wide data sets so that we can define regulatory elements in the human and mouse genomes. So here is a snapshot of these uh, epigen epigenomic signals um, at an exemplar locus. Uh, SP1 um, is a transcription factor itself. This gene encodes a pretty uh, powerful transcription factor for development. And this is the five prime end of the gene. Um, these uh, thick bars are exons and these arrowheads indicate the introns um, in between. So you can see that um, DNAs, open chromatin regions, um, correspond to the beginning of the gene. But also this intergenic region uh, ahead of uh, upstream the gene and somewhere here too. And these two kinds of histone, histone modifications, histone three, lysine 4, trimethylation, I will call it H3K4ME3, indicated um, as a red, red color, because this is a marker, this histone mark is a marker for um, active and uh, um, actively transcribed uh, five prime end of a gene right here. Well, you may ask me, why does it show up here? Well, this may have uh, another transcription star site that's not annotated or um, um, uh, another, um, another gene that I'm not showing here. So sometimes it shows up um, outside uh, transcription star site regions, but most of the time H3K4ME3 shows up at TSSs. Um, another histone mark, H3K27AC, where AC indicates acetylation, um, is, a, is a marker for active enhancers. That's why I'm coloring it yellow. So um, this usually ha have very high signal at enhancer regions. Okay. Sometimes you can also observe K27AC at promoters as well. Um, but typically there is a, a, a balance uh, trade-off between K4ME3 and K27AC between promoter regions and enhancer regions. Okay, so I didn't mention this um, transcription fa factor called the CTCF. Um, it's called a CTCC binding factor. Um, the name, um, it's, it's kind of a mysterious protein because it, it does many different kinds of things. So uh, one of its well-known function is to bind to the insulator regions in the human genome. And I mentioned earlier 
um, CTCF uh, insulators. Um, it demarcates the genomic boundary, um, sometimes um, prevents some enhancers talking to neighboring TSSs. So CTCF has also been shown to be very important by, by uh, very important for higher order chromatin structure, such as forming loops between distant chromatin loci, and, and also um, with, um, with chromatin changing phase during cell cycle. So CTCF usually doesn't happen at the promoter region. This one is in the intron and that one is in intergenic regions. So um, when, we, um, when we started out this project, we, um, we want to um, integrate all these epigenomic data to define regulatory elements. And uh, we took stock of um, published methods at that time, and there had been quite a lot already. And some of them pioneered by uh, ENCODE uh, members. Um, you might have heard of ChromeHMM, Segway, uh, RefX. These are examples of the tools produced by ENCODE members. Um, however, these tools require many different kinds of experiments to be done on the same biosample. So that it integrates things on the same biosample. Um, here is um, the ENCODE data matrix. And you can see that um, it, it it depends on, we, we try really hard to coordinate the experiments, but um, it's still kind of sparse. Um, some biosamples have a lot of data, like several cell lines have um, a lot of TF chip seq data. And uh, um, some, uh, so here are tissue, tissue data on tissue samples, and here are primary cell um, data sets, and then these are cell lines and these are in vitro differentiated cells. You see these numbers are the number of um, experiments we have. Um, you can see some of them have um, a lot of histone chip seq, some have DNAs. Um, so um, looks, the total number is very impressive, um, but it's kind of sparse when you go into individual biosamples, um, especially um, like um, if you match them up by the same donor, um, so that they are not from different donors, but the same tissue type. So um, in order to take into account um, the sparse uh, data matrix, when you look at the individual biosamples, um, also um, we, we sought to develop a method that can um, be applied to as many cell types as possible, um, because um, all these transcriptional regulation is quite cell type specific especially at enhancers. So we came up with a rather simple uh, scheme of using as much experimental data as possible. So um, how our scheme goes as follows. Um, so first we make the observation about um, open chromatin regions. So a lot of these regulatory uh, elements are open chromatin, as I said earlier, because if it's occupied by a nucleosome, very often you can't get to the DNA to use it for regulatory functions. Here is the same locus, the SP1 locus I showed earlier. And you see um, when I spin out and there are additional genes. And uh, each row is a DNA seq data set um, showing with peaks in this locus. So you can see that this is a cell line A679, 673, an astrocyte B cells, um, bipolar, um, neuron, so on and so forth. So every row is a different biosample. And you can see these open chromatin regions, um, they really um, quite uh, interestingly, they line up very, very neatly uh, along the genomic locations. Some of them um, seem to light up across all the biosamples we have here. I think I list 28 of the biosamples here. Um, these we call ubiquitous open chromatin regions. And some of them seem to be cell type specific. For example, this one is only in K562, and uh, this one is only here, and that is a cardiac muscle cell. So, um, um, however, um, um, we can just take note of the locations of these open chromatin regions. Um, we call these 
DNA's hypersensitive sites, DHSs. And we can take a representation. So for each location, we know down where it is and use uh, one peak, which has the highest signal across the biosamples. Use that peak as the representative. So these um, boxes indicate um, our DHSs, representative DNA's hypersensitive sites across all the samples for which we have DNA's seq data. So you can see that um, we can just focus on um, these RDHS regions and uh, not worried about the rest of the genome because they, they are unlikely to be open chromatin. And uh, ENCODE has um, DNA data on over 700 biosamples. So it's quite a, a comprehensive uh, coverage of different cell types and tissue types. So we, um, we are um, um, quite uh, confident that a good number of um, um, regulatory elements are included in these RDHSs, um, except that there might be uh, some um, cell types that are very rare in the body and that have not been assayed by ENCODE. So in total, when we compile all these data together, um, we curate 2.2 million RDHSs in the human genome. And this is the human genome version, GRCH38, and uh, to 1.2 million RDHSs in the mouse genome. This is MM10 um, uh, genome version. And the reason that uh, we have more in human than in mouse is because um, we have more data in human. It's not because um, we are inherently more complicated in terms of gene regulation than mouse, although we might want to think that way. But this difference is, is actually due to data availability. So after we have um, the RDHSs, now we go back to integrate these other epigenomic data. So we, um, we require um, the RDHSs to be further supported by um, H3K4 ME3 signal in at least one of the biosamples, or um, H3K27 AC signal in at least one of the biosamples, or um, at least um, high CTCF signal in at least one of the biosamples we have data for. And uh, if an RDHS is further supported by any one of these three epigenomic signals, then we promote it. To, to be candidate cis regulatory elements. So in abbreviation, CCREs, candidate cis regulatory elements. And we really stress this uh, small C here to be candidate because these are defined using epigenomic signals. And uh, we have only tested um, a small subset of these CCREs using functional data, which you will hear in a minute. And, um, and so these remain um, predictions to guide further experiments. So after these um, further support, it results in uh, 927,000 human CCREs and 340,000 mouse CCREs for the moment. And we, um, we are um, regularly updating uh, these two registries so that um, we can incorporate additional ENCODE data that's um, being produced um, at the current uh, phase four of the ENCODE project. And we will put out a new version by the end of this year and another new version by the end of next year. And by that time, um, and the ENCODE project will conclude uh, by, the, um, by close to the end of uh, 2021. So, um, so we have these CCREs. So um, we obviously want to classify them for potential function, regulatory function. So some of them have promoter-like signatures, uh, abbreviated as PLS, promoter-like signatures. And they overlap annotated transcription star sites. And they have both DN high DNAs and high K4ME3 signals. So there are 35,000 of these. And they correspond to uh, very well annotated uh, gene starts in the genome. Um, a subset of uh, CCREs uh, um, have enhancer-like signatures, they can be proximal or distal to the transcription star site. They cannot overlap the TSS, but they can be proximal to it. Actually, a lot of uh, in proximal enhancers are near TSSs. So they must have high DNAs 
and high K27AC signals. And uh, the proximal ones, for the proximal ones, gene, uh, the ones proximal to TSSs, and there are 142,000 of these. And for the distal ones, there are quite a few, um, 668,000. And then there are some other regulatory elements uh, we don't understand as well as um, the enhancer-like or promoter-like elements. Uh, specifically, um, if there are some elements that have high DNAs, high K27, uh, high HCK4 ME3, however, low K27 AC, and they don't overlap TSS, um, we don't really know um, what they do for now. Um, we just put them in this pink bucket um, DNAs K4ME3, they possibly either are novel promoters or poised enhancers. So there are not so many of them, 26,000 of them. And there are also um, CTCF only elements. So they have high DNAs, high CTCF, but low K4ME3 and the low K27AC. And these are good candidates for boundary elements or enhancer, uh, insulators. And we have 57,000 of them in the genome. So these are um, uh, human CCREs, and the mouse CCREs are um, proportionally smaller. Um, and you can, you can read about them more in detail if you're interested in our publication. So um, classifying CCREs, um, that was a, a, a classification I just showed was um, taking into account all possible biosamples we have data for. Um, furthermore, for a specific biosample, we can further classify them into um, these categories. And uh, with one more category, DNAs only, means high DNAs, but no other um, uh, epigenomic signal, um, just the DNAs only. So um, you can see here, for hepatocytes, um, these are liver cells cells that function in liver, in the liver. So there are uh, roughly 137,000 out of the 923,000 uh, total CCREs that we classify in, to, to be potentially, could, could be potentially function, functional in hepatocytes. And uh, you see here, they are color coded like red, um, yellow, and blue, um, as, as we indicate here. And uh, the ones that have low DNAs are indicated in, in gray. So we're thinking out of the huge registry, nearly a, a million, um, roughly 137,000 might be functional in hepatocytes, while the rest are less likely to be functional and, and they are from other biosamples. Okay, so there are several advantages of using the registry of CCREs. One is um, they have rather high resolution. So all these CCREs are between 150 and 350 base pairs wide each. And you can see here, um, it's because um, the DNA's seq experiments really get at very high resolution, spatial resolution. Here you can see there are three um, peaks here for DNA's seq signal correspond to three CCREs. And uh, they, um, they, they, they can be interpreted as three displaced nucleosomes in the genome. And the other one is, um, um, it might be by design, but we view it as a, a, an advantage. So the boundaries of these CCREs remain, remain constant across hundreds of biosamples. Um, we, are, we have seen uh, examples where peaks shift slightly and in different biosamples, but such cases are very rare and far in between. And it's much more um, economical in terms of um, the annotation to keep these boundaries um, constant across hundreds of biosamples. As you can see here um, in different uh, biosamples here, two of them are being compared. One is a hepatocyte, the other one is neuron. And you can see these peaks really line up very well. and. Uh, the fixed boundary serves as well. And we accession these CCREs, um, start with genome number, genome version, and mouse human, and also these um, unique accessions so that you can track um, from version to version. And if you have studied some CCRE earlier, they, they are never lost in our collection. 
And also, um, we have built a web-based tool called a screen to enable the exploration and integration of these CCREs. So here is um, a, a screenshot of um, the, uh, the tool, and you can access the tool by this, um, this uh, URL, screen.encoproject.org. And uh, there is a short movie that illustrates what you can do. So you can, you can search with a gene, and then once you go in, um, so there's this main table here in the area. Um, those are the CCREs. Each CCRE is a row. And then you can um, search by biosample. It's kind of smart. And when you search for heart, you will get cardiac muscle cells. And once you get in, um, you have these signals. These are the signals of um, each epigenomic um, experiment and expressed as z-score. And you can uh, survey the CCREs by these z-scores. And if you want to narrow down your search, you can adjust the threshold you want to look at so that you have a shorter table or longer table. And we, we also show um, the expression of um, genes. So this is the gene SP1 I mentioned earlier. And uh, you can go by experiments, by tissue and rampage is a uh, uh, encode assay type that assays the activity of transcription start sites so assay the five prime end of each transcript and each gene that has multiple transcripts will show up with multiple panels here so these are different transcripts okay so um so when you go to a uh, uh, screen you will see all these um, panels um, for example, there is a details panel that shows the accession of the CCRE and uh, the coordinates in the genome and these color coding for the signals. So red is H3K43, yellow is H3K27AC, and the blue is a CTCF signal. And you can go into a specific biosample and you can see that these annotations are um, which classification it belongs to in that particular sample. And you can see most of them, they are um, consistent. Like, like this one, this example, most of the time it is promoter-like, um, but um, in some biosamples, they, they are classified as proximal enhancer-like. So this is overall, um, it's cell type agnostic, and then in particular cell type, you can have slightly different classification. And we also um, intersect with um, other data, like other ENCODE data. So we have many ChIP-seq data for transcription factors. Here are transcription factors. Um, and uh, um, number of experiments that support TF binding out of um, number of experiments for which we have data for. For example, we have 180 ChIP-seq data sets for CTCF, and uh, eight out of the 180 support that CTCF binds to this particular um, CCRE. And if you click on these eight, it will bring you to the specific ENCODE data, and then you can get to the experiments right away using um, the ENCODE um, uh, data set accession numbers uh, from the data coordination center of the ENCODE project. So likewise, in, in addition to transcription factor, you can also um, overlap um, the CCRE with histone mark ChIP-seq. And again, similar table indicating how much shows what kind of histone modification. And I showed um, the, um, the expression. So you can, uh, for each CCRE, you can look at the gene that's nearest and uh, um, using both RNA-seq and uh, Rampage data. So, so that was a summary of um, the registry of CCREs and uh, the tool screen for exploring it. So from now on, I'm going to uh, go on to uh, talk additional things that make, um, make these CCREs useful. So one thing is um, for the CCREs that are distal, that are far away from a gene, um, it would be very desirable to know um, which genes the CCRE might regulate. So uh, 
a lot of effort in the field has been spent on linking CCREs with their target genes. As illustrated by uh, all these ex uh, experiments, for example, EQTL, expression quantitative trait loci, um, this is um, a huge effort of the GTEx consortium that you can um, measure the, the gene expression and then correlate with the variance of the sample. Like here um, are the variants um, at a particular uh, single nucleotide polymorphism location um, for the two alleles. You can have different combinations. So when you correlate these together, if they correlate um, the, the SNP single nuclear hypermorphism, in short SNP, um, might be in a regulatory element that might regulate the expression of a gene. So um, another example is using um, um, CRISPR, the technique of um, um, knocking out the gene um, or um, knocking out a region in the genome um, and, and correlate them in a single cell manner um, this, in this publication um, from uh, the Shanduri lab, um, they correlate these two to try to link um, each, each element with the gene. And then um, you can also perform a direct uh, three-dimensional chromatin interaction assays, such as CHIA-PET. Uh, CHIA-PET uh, is um, a bit like CHIP-seq, but when you pull out the chromatin fragment, you try to grab the neighboring chromatin fragments that are in, interacting with the part you pull out so that you can get at the um, long range chromatin interaction. And HI-C is another technique that's doing pretty similar to CHIA-PET and it was invented before CHIA-PET um, and uh, HI-C basically grabs all the long range interactions and, and regardless, the, 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 the antibody you use, it doesn't use an antibody, but just grabs all the long range uh, chromatin interactions and then notes them. So we have been collecting these kind of data and uh, um, in intersecting with our CCREs to, uh, to lend the support for their coding genes. So um, screen also um, lists all of these we find, like the genes it links to, um, which kind of supporting experiment for each specific CCREs, and then the publications of um, that data, where the data comes from. So, um, so okay, so um, from, um, from that point of view, um, so we have a registry of CCREs, and uh, obviously during the effort, we, we wanted to know how accurate our registry is. So we used a whole battery of techniques to try to um, test and uh, validate these CCREs, even though we consider them as predictions. So one is um, using different kinds of functional assays. Here is um, a paper from uh, the Van Stensel lab on um, promoter activity, promoter activity. So they identify um, promoters in K562 cells and uh, um, we can overlap what they identify with the annotation of CCREs, all possible CCREs. Um, here is the, the total genome, very low percentage have promoter activity. But if you look at the all CCREs, it's higher. And specifically, if you look at the CCREs defined in K562 cells as well, it's much higher. And then the ones that have um, promoter-like signatures and much higher and so on and so forth. So, we can use this kind of technique to validate. And then another technique um, is um, to use transgenic mouse assays to test specifically a region's enhancer activity. So this technique tests one region at a time, but it's really high throughput in terms of it's being able to be performed across all tissues because it's staining the entire mouse embryo. So you take the region, we actually designed these regions, we picked out from our prediction and uh, design, you get the region, the DNA and perform microinjection of the DNA into um, fertilized mouse eggs and then wait for, uh, for the embryo to form. Um, usually these are embryonic stage, either day 11.5 or 12.5. At that point, the embryo is still transparent 
and then you can stain for the target gene. In this case, this is leg Z is the gene that's cloned to be downstream of our elements um, for their activity. And you can see that they show up here in, in heart, in forebrain, in limbs. And this is a particular uh, data set, data we collected for our validation that shows up in the two limb buds. So um, here is an illustration of um, several of the CCREs that we tested. So these are the CCREs um, here and uh, um, the tested regions. And these are um, in short for the tissue, forebrain, midbrain, limb, hindbrain, um, heart, um, LM, I'm blanking out what LM stands for. So these are all different tissues. And then these are the epigenetic signals and uh, the tested regions. And this element is um, active in midbrain. This one is active in hindbrain, limb, and hindbrain. So uh, we tested uh, quite a, a, a bunch of them. So these are the number of regions we tested. We selected these regions based on their epigenetic signals in midbrain, hindbrain, and limb, and um, tested for their activity um, on embryonic day 11.5. And here are the percent of the predicted regions that are active. Um, and we tested another batch of them, different regions, selected for uh, epigenomic signals um, on E12.5 and then tested for their activity on E12.5. So um, the take home message here is um, um, the validation rate is quite reasonable um, and uh, um, the higher ranked elements tend to um, have a higher validation rate slightly here. So here, um, here two bars, um, one is ranking um, in the top 1000 and here is the ranking after 1000. And you can see that the first bar is inevitably taller than the second bar. And the other take home message is uh, sometimes when it's not active in the predicted tissue, it also it turns out, some of them turns out to be active in other tissues in mouse. Um, they also have um, epigenomic signals, so um, which indicates um, that um, it's a good indication, but but sometimes um, um, it's not as specific as we liked. Okay, so at the end of my talk, um, I just want to present a, a concrete use case as to how you could use our registry um, to annotate disease-associated variants. Since I started out by saying that one of the motivations of um, annotating these uh, regulatory elements is because a huge portion of the disease associated variants are located inside regulatory elements. So for the elements, um, if you're interested in um, GWAS genome-wide association studies, um, there is this uh, catalog, GWAS catalog, that's constructed by NHGRI, which is um, the, the Institute, National Health Institute um, Genome Research. Um, NHGRI is the institute that, that funds the ENCODE project. Um, EBI is uh, the European Bioinformatics Institute. So the two organizations jointly uh, fund the effort of um, putting together this GWAS catalog and has um, 3, 000, over 3,000 uh, genome-wide association studies. So for each study, um, it has a trait or a disease or any kind of phenotype, and it has a list of SNPs that are associated across the population with that particular phenotype. Um, some of the studies have a um, 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 large number of SNPs. Some uh, majority, like 10% of them, have more than 20 SNPs. These are tagged SNPs. Um, when you use an array, a SNP array, to do the association, um, the arrays are designed to um, take advantage of the linkage disequilibrium of the SNPs on the human genome so that for a um, link linked region, you only need one tag SNP for economical reasons. Um, but obviously, right now, there are a lot of whole genome sequencing um, data available or fine mapping so that you can get to more SNPs. Um, but a lot of these studies um, are still using tagged SNPs. And we have to computationally take into account the, the other SNPs that are in linkage disequilibrium with these tagged SNPs. 
So for these um, 397 studies that have more than 20 tagged SNPs, uh, we further identify disease variant biosamples by enrichment analysis. For example, the first here, um, we go through all the cell type specific CCRE annotations and um, the liver one has the highest correlation with the SNPs that were identified to be associated with um, um, high density um, cholesterol, HDL cholesterol level, um, which appears to be the correct biosample because liver is, um, is, is highly involved in the production and, uh, and consumption of cholesterol. So for, well, for all of the studies, 3,800 uh, 3, of the studies, we um, use our CCREs to annotate, possibly predict uh, causal variants. So um, for one, one example I'm showing here, um, there are two studies indicate that a particular SNP, this SNP, is associated with schizophrenia. So here is um, this SNP is in the intron of this A gap one gene. Okay, um, it does not overlap a specific CCRE. Um, here is um, linkage disequilibrium comes into play. Um, so, uh, however, this um, this SNP is um, in linkage high linkage disequilibrium here shown as LD with 13, 39 other SNPs and uh, six of these SNPs overlap a CCRE. So we suspect this SNP is only a tagging SNP and it's not truly functional in terms of regulating any phenotype associated with schizophrenia, but rather it's one of these um, high LD SNPs that are actually doing the regulation. So if we look at these six um, SNPs that overlap CCRE and look at the activity of the CCRE as indicated by their epigenetic signals. And you can see this particular one shows up in neuronal cells, okay? But the other ones are less relevant to the phenotype of uh, schizophrenia. So this one, so we dive into more. And uh, this particular CCRE now, the one that shows up with activity and you can see it has a high um, DNA signal in brain tissues, um, embryonic tissues, um, and uh, also in the eye, eye muscle. And we can take into account the, the fact that we have a registry with both human and mouse um, to, to um, take advantage of the evolutionary conservation between the two mammalian species. And this um, CCRE is autologous in the genomic structure with a mouse CCRE as well. And then for mouse, we have um, tissue samples, especially a whole panel of fetal development tissue. That's brain. It's quite interesting. If you look at the developmental time point, um, these are embryonic day from 10.5 all the way to 16.5 and then P0 is the birth. And you can see that um, the K27AC score of this particular element and kind of goes up and comes back down. So it's likely to be active in a particular window of development. And uh, um, we further performed additional experiment um, to try to validate this particular um, CCRE in mouse using transgenic mouse assays. So we designed the region um, that's overlapping this, um, this LD SNP and over, overlapping our CCRE between human and mouse. And then we did this injection of that region with the LEG-Z reporter gene into mouse embryo. And there, here are two examples of um, the, the, the um, expression. And indeed, you see this um, blue color indicates the activity in brain regions. And we also have additional embryos um, for 11. Um, here are 11.5. We also have E12.5 to show that um, it's indeed relevant that corresponds to this window that shows activity. And if you look into these, um, this region, you can see overlaps with uh, SP3 motif. And uh, the SNP, um, the SNP is um, specifically um, 
um, overlapping one of the motif sites inside the motif um, that might be causing um, SP3 binding uh, change. So um, that was the use case. I just want to wrap up. Um, today, I told you about our work on the registry of CCREs. And uh, I told you about how we built this registry. We integrated thousands of epigenomic data sets to annotate almost 1 million candidate cis regulatory elements in the human genome. And we validated a subset of these predictions using both public, published functional data and also by performing transgenic mouse enhancer assays ourselves um, as part of the ENCODE consortium effort. And in conclusion, um, we hope that the CCREs can be used to generate hypotheses for many different biological problems, including the one use case I illustrated of annotating disease-associated genetic variations. So um, I want to uh, also indicate that we're working on additional uh, ways of improving our registry, and we can increase the coverage by inc incorporating um, the data from new cell types. Um, I'm also part of the psych encode, so brain tissue uh, for psychiatric disorders, and the public data, including blueprint, and additional public data just straight out of geo, gene expression omnibus. And also um, defining new types of CCREs. Uh, we don't have silencer, repressor as part of our definition, and we are annotating those as we speak, and there are additional types. And I want to acknowledge people who did the work. Um, um, this um, registry work has been done by three very talented individuals in my lab. Um, Jill Moore was a PhD student um, when ENCODE uh, phase three started. And uh, Michael Picaro uh, was an MD PhD student at the, at the same time. And, and Henry Pratt is another um, MD PhD student um, in the course of ENCO3, Jill has graduated and, uh, and now she's actually serving as the project manager for the ENCO data, data analysis center because she really knows the ins and outs of uh, ENCO data and how to work with people collaboratively. And Michael Poparo is in his final phase of his MD training. Um, he also graduated in the, in, in the meantime. And Henry Pratt is still a PhD student in our lab. And I mentioned this resource, screen.encoproject.org. If you're interested, make sure to check it out. Um, and also, um, this is the ENCODE issue. It's actually a paper package, has um, quite a few papers. Um, they describe individual data sets that I mentioned for building the registry of CCREs, but there are in-depth analysis of individual data types. And if you are interested in that data type, make sure to check out the remaining papers in that package. And I'm really grateful to uh, our collaboration with Lynn Panacchio's group um, at uh, um, um, LBNL, um, Berkeley Lab. Um, and uh, his team is very talented in performing these kind of experiments that are not easy to perform. And uh, um, um, Diane Dico is uh, also a PI uh, working with Len, and then Valencia, Valentina is the postdoc who performed those staining specifically for testing um, the, the last uh, schizophrenia associated uh, variant. And obviously, um, none of these would have been possible without the large consortium uh, with just one puzzle in the uh, one piece in the in the big puzzle, and uh, we. We um, work with each other and try to generate resources that are high quality and of use to the general research uh, community. Well, thank you very much. That's all I have to say. And uh, I don't know if we have any time for answering questions. Uh, we have as much time as you're willing to give us. Um, there's no strict schedule for these. Um, we do have a, a few questions, though. Um, OK. The, the very first one, um, you mentioned the potential schizophrenia SNP that might disrupt uh, SP3 binding. Uh, they know there are a few transcription factors that bind motifs that are very similar to the SP3 motifs. Do any of these TFs have uh, chip seek data in relevant cell types? And if so, do they have peaks at that location? Yeah, that's a really good question. Um, we actually um, 
looked at them and uh, um, at that moment we didn't find any uh, very coherent uh, conclusions as to sp1 sp2 sp3 whether or not they have chip seek in brain tissues um, we didn't collect data to support that so we we didn't put it in the paper but that's that would be a natural way of uh, pursuing um, these kind of findings to follow up with additional experiments. That makes sense. Um, our next question um, starts with saying, excellent job. Um, they'd like to know if there are courses or workshops to learn how to use the data from screen and encode. Oh, that is a really good question. I should have done some advertisement for encode. <laughs> so every year, ENCODE has this users meeting, and this year we have a users meeting. I'll be more than happy to send it out to you, Seth, um, the information. It's coming up. Um, I think it's um, in a couple of weeks. Um, and uh, today, th this time, it's open to, um, to, because it's virtual, so it's open to pretty much anybody who is interested, and uh, you can sign up. Um, and during the users meeting, we, sh we teach things like how to use the ENCODE portal, how to get to the ENCODE data, uh, how to use the screen, how to use registry, and how to use other resources that are produced by ENCODE consortium members. Excellent. Um, we'll absolutely have to get me the um, link for that, and I will get it out to the, the membership at large. Mm -hmm. That would be great. Um, <clears throat> excuse me. Our next question. Um, if I have uh, WGS data from a patient cohort, how do I go about mapping all non-coding variants to promoters or enhancers and subsequently the genes that they regulate? Yeah, that's a really good question. Um, we have been building um, the resource of uploading a bed file to screen and then you can download a table of the CCIEs. Um, I can um, I can double check with my team to see if um, that's available. Um, uh, whoever is asking that question, can you just directly send me an email, and I can get you a more concrete answer in reply. Fair enough. Um, and then our last question: um, What advances are anticipated in Encode four compared to Encode three? That is another very good question. Um, so um, ENCODE 4 obviously will generate more data of the same type and, and additional data types. Um, among the um, new things in ENCODE 4 is a whole set of functional characterization centers. Um, Lens Group is leading one of those centers. So we will, the, the consortium will produce um, a lot of um, high throughput, uh, CRISPR-based assay results, um, and also um, MPRA, massively parallel reporter sequencing, and mouse transgenic, so directly testing regions in the genome for their molecular and biological functions. So that's one thing that's in ENCO4, but not in ENCO3, in addition to continue to generate more data, even more data. Always hard to predict the future. Uh, and I stand corrected. We have had more questions. Um, next question is, um, is it ENCODE 3 is only survey, uh, surveying two histone marks? What about the others? Oh, it, it, we just used those two for building the registry of CCIEs. We actually survey quite a lot of different other kinds of uh, histone marks. In one of the slides, I show that we can overlap the CCIEs with the peaks of other ENCODE chip -seek histone marks. So we didn't use them in the construction of the CCREs because um, they, they were not uh, as characteristic as the two we used, and they didn't cover a whole ton of biosamples. But after we have built the CCREs, you can go back and compare with those ENCODE data of other histone marks. Right. Uh, another question. Um, what is the overlap of the CCREs in ENCODE with GeneHancer from GeneCards? Um, actually, um, GeneHancer has three components, and uh, one of the three components was an earlier version of our CCREs. 
So um, I don't know if the overlap would be circular or not, but they certainly take into a, a consideration what we build and they have indicated that they're going to update to incorporate our um, published version.